Pascal. All right, Pons, I'm going to – yeah. <clears throat> we do both the teams, two different kinds of uh, – of electronic uh, education lately, and one is Teams and and the other is Zoom. So I'm have, I'm trying to figure out how to do each one. Uh, I'll I'll sort of keep my video on in case y'all want to see me. If you don't, that's fine. If it gets to be much of a drag in terms of being able to uh, uh, broadcast, I'll I'll close mine off. I think most of you may have a microphone on or off. It's okay. Marco, it's going to is going to uh, sort of monitor the chat. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, just holler. I did change my pointer to sort of a red arrow because I'll use it a little bit. It's a little bit easier to see. Uh, you will get copies of all my slides. So we're gonna talk about a number of things today. I'm, I'm, I was in the process of converting them to a, a smaller file size and uh, and I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy, uh, probably sometime today, Marco, or at least maybe tomorrow for sure. That and, sounds good. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm not going to actually cover all these cattle diseases, uh, and they're certainly it's, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Uh, but there are some things that when when we talk about herd health management, I want to emphasize that you need to work with your veterinarian. Uh, I realize that we don't we don't don't have good veterinarians everywhere or enough good veterinarians everywhere. Uh, you know, I, in some parts of the southwestern part of the state, we got a veterinarian. He's covering four or five counties, or she's covering four or five counties. So we're blessed that in the valley, sometimes we uh, in, in areas of the valley, we have really good beef cattle veterinarians, and so we need to include them. If they can kind of give you an idea of what you need to vaccinate for, when you need to vaccinate for it. So on this list, I've just got some diseases. Now, as Marco said, really I cover from Uvalde to College Station and South. So we have a lot of different diseases in those different areas. And this is sort of a general listing of all those. But really I sort of have them grouped in the two, two or three biggest groups that are important are what we call the sudden death diseases. Those are the ones that you recognize, we call black leg as a general group, uh, black leg vaccine, uh, black leg vaccination. Uh, the other that's a big issue with us are the reproductive diseases. Uh, and then the last group that's, sort of, that's important are the respiratory diseases. And so we'll talk about those. The black leg diseases are important because they're in the soil and they affect calves at a very young age. Uh, sometimes as early as two or three months of age, but they also affect mature animals too. So it's the number one leading cause of death in mature animals, cows and bulls, is black leg. Uh, reproductive diseases, the biggest one that we used to have was brucellosis or bangs. It, causes, it used to cause abortion. Uh, cows would transmit it to each other by licking uh, aborted fetuses. Uh, but we have a vaccine for that. We're free of that disease, but I just threw it in there. Uh, lepto, leptospirosis uh, is actually a disease that has five different varieties. So it's sort of like the coronavirus, all right, except it's, uh, it's really a bacteria. And it's got five different varieties, and it's transmitted by things like wild dogs and pigs. If you've got, if you've got water on your place that wild hogs can get into or wildlife can get into and they urinate, it's passed in the urine, gets in that water, cow takes a drink of it, she can pick it up. Uh, it is a, it's an abortion disease, it causes abortion, typically late abortion. Uh, and we typically recommend everybody vaccinate their females for lepto. You don't have to vaccinate males, you vaccinate females. And you can vaccinate for all five types in one shot. Uh, another one that we have that's, that's sort of, you know, it, 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 it sort of comes and goes is Vibrio. Uh, we think that probably most cows have been exposed to it. That doesn't mean that they have it, but they've been exposed to it. Uh, uh, vibriosis causes very early abortion. So what would happen is you have a set of heifers 
that you bring into the cow herd and you're breeding them. And uh, the cows have had Vibrio. They've been exposed to it, sort of like when your kids go to school or your kids went to school and they got chicken pox, okay? Uh, and, and so they, they, other kids didn't get it because they'd been exposed to it. Well, what happens is these heifers get exposed to Vibrio and then you start having abortions and these heifers start coming back into heat. That's the, the so that, that, that's a problem that we have. So we, we, we generally vaccinate for Vibrio and Lepto in one shot. Uh, then down at the little, there's a button down there we see trichomoniasis or trick. There's not a good vaccine for that. It, we see it in the cows, but it is carried by bulls. And typically it's carried by older bulls. And that was an issue that we had for many, many years uh, in the northwestern part of the United States. It really wasn't in Texas. The last 20, 25 years or so, we've brought some of those northern cattle into the state. And so now we have trick. And what that causes is early abortion. Uh, we really don't have a good vaccine against trick. So in other words, we don't have a vaccine that prevents trick but we have a vaccine that reduces the effects of trichomoniasis. And so it, it's, it, uh, you vaccinate your cows or you vaccinate your heifers and maybe you won't get an abortion. Maybe they won't abort, but it really doesn't protect them from getting the disease. They may have the disease and just have a milder case of it. And then down there, the third group that I wanted to talk about was respiratory. All right, and so if we look at those, uh, we did, when I was in college, when I was in high school 35, 35 years ago when I was in college, we thought respiratory diseases were principally a problem of feed yard cattle. Well, we do know now that because we move cattle around, we haul cattle around, we've got some of these respiratory diseases in our, in our cow herd. Uh, two of them cause abortion. One is the very first one that you see there, infectious, rhinotracheitis, and, and, and the rhinotracheitis are up here in the nose. And so lots of times when cattle get this, their nose peels and runs, we call that red nose. Uh, and it causes late abortion. Uh, the other one that causes abortion is bovine virus diarrhea, and it sounds kind of, you wonder, well, how in the world do we call that a respiratory disease? Because it's diarrhea. You know, it affects the other end. It doesn't affect this end. Well, it's because it's transmitted nasally. We can transmit that disease by, by saliva. All these diseases, okay, with the exception of black leg, are transmitted by either ingestion or exchange of fluid. So blood or semen or reproductive fluids of the cow, urine, feces, any of those can transmit most of these diseases. Now, we do recommend that we vaccinate for these respiratory diseases. Uh, we generally don't just vaccinate for IBR or bovine virus diarrhea. We vaccinate for the other two as well. So typically when the veterinarian or you decide on a vaccination program, you know, you'll, you'll select a black leg vaccine that typically has seven ways. And then you'll select for a lepto vibrio respiratory all in one. So you can, you can vaccinate for five lepto organisms. You can vaccinate for vibrio and you can vaccinate for four respiratory diseases. So in one shot, you take care of 10 organisms. And, uh, so, you know, we're really not talking about vaccinating for lots of lots and lots of diseases with lots and lots of shots. We're only talking about two injections, one for black leg. Seven way black leg takes care of most of the black leg. Sometimes you'll see an eight way black leg and that's for tetanus. Okay. And then you'll see the vibrio lepto respiratory and that takes care of 10. So you can get a lot of, a lot of shots done with just two. So let's look at the, we already talked about this working with your veterinarian. I really think 
when you, if you have a good veterinarian, develop a plan, what you're going to vaccinate for, when you're going to deworm, what you're going to do. You may or may not always have that veterinarian there to do those things, but they can help you design a herd health plan because veterinarians know what's going on in your county. Uh, they see all the different diseases that are out there. Uh, they see a lot more ranches than I do. They see a lot more different ty types of diseases and parasite issues. And just sit down and sort of make a little health plan. What do I need to do? And then at the same time, you can say, okay, well, Doc, if I get my cow gets a snake bite, what do you recommend that we do? Or my cows, it gets cut. What do you recommend that we do? You can sort of, if you have that veterinarian backstopping you on that, they can give you some of those additional pieces of advice but you don't always have to run your cow into the vet or they don't have to always come out because their time's valuable. And, and, and the other thing to remember is that when you do this herd health program, write down what you do. Write down what was given and who got it and when it was given and make sure you put stuff like the product name, maybe even the serial number of the product because sometimes Sometimes these products have been mishandled, not by you, not by the manufacturer, but in the process of transit. And I'll give you an example. The other day I was at a feed store near here and I was looking for some Black Lake vaccine. And I looked in the, in the cooler and it was cool and it was nice and it had a thermometer and it was at the appropriate temperature. But when I looked at the expiration date, it had been expired for a year. And when I called it to the attention of the owner, they were like, well, it's still good. It's been in there all that time. That's just a sell-by date. Well, yes and no, okay? Expiration dates are expiration dates. They're not sell-by dates. So always check expiration dates uh, when you buy product. So this talks to this valid client-patient relationship. And what this means is that if your veterinarian knows what you're doing, knows you, knows your cattle, knows your level of expertise. Uh, that makes them, they're more confident that when they ask you to do something or they tell you to do something, that it'll be done. And this is becoming more and more important now that we're looking at moving antibiotics, all antibiotics from over the counter. So you're not gonna go to be able to go to the feed store or TSC at some point in the future, maybe next year, maybe two years from now and say, I need a bottle of penicillin, all right? You're gonna to have to have a script to get that done. And, uh, and that script's gonna to have to come from a veterinarian. And that's because we're not making any new antibiotics. And there's a perception that we use too many antibiotics in livestock, which we don't, but that's the perception. And antibiotics are very, very important in human health. Even an antibiotic like teramycin, that's not used very much in the human side because it burns when they use it. Paramycin is the only antibiotic that's effective against a lot of tick-borne diseases. And so pay attention to what we're using, write down what we use, how much we use it, when we use it, and what we use it in, okay? And that's part of this herd health plan. We've already talked about that. But the other thing I want to visit with you about is this uh, concept of biosecurity. Okay, so this, this makes sure that, that I mean, I, when I first started thinking about this 20 years ago, I looked at the gate to my ranch and I had like four or five locks on it. Now, one of them was, was electric company, one of them was an oil company, one was mine, one was a previous owner's, and one was a guy that was hunting hogs on my place with my permission. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'm not very secure. I mean, anybody that has one of these keys can come on my place. And so we need to think about that. We need to think about who comes on to your place. I mean, we always have a lot of animals, wildlife that comes on to our place. None of us may not have high fences. And so animals do come across, birds fly across it. But let's think about the two-legged people that walk across it, or maybe, our, or maybe visitors that come across, it, and they're coming from their cattle operations, or stray cattle. I used to have a big problem with stray cattle. Um, and, and good fences make good neighbors, but we always had some animal that wanted to come over. And so, you know, you can get diseases from those animals as well.
So let's talk about this. This is what I do. So these are not pictures of my cattle. I'll, I'll tell you when we have pictures of my cattle. But this is sort of what I do with in con consultation with my veterinarian. Okay, I want to put that in perspective. So about three months of age, and I'm a little bit behind now. I like to try to get a black leg shot in those calves at the very least, and I use a seven way shot. Uh, the eighth way could be for tetanus or red water. If you have liver fluke, so some of my country north of here and close to say the coast, they have liver flukes. And we'll show you what those are if you don't know what they are. We do have liver flukes in the lower Rio Grande Valley in some areas. So that's where your veterinarian's important. Uh, about three months of age, I give them that and try to revaccinate it within about 30 days. Okay, sometimes I don't get that done, so I do it at weaning. I give them from a lepto shot, that's the heifers only. And then I give them this four way respirator. Okay. And so I try to think about at least giving the black leg shot at, at, at three months. And then I'll come back at weaning and make sure I hit these others. So at weaning time, here's sort of what I do I revaccinate for black leg. I'll revaccinate for black leg if I didn't give them that booster shot at three months of age. And then I'll make sure I'm respiratory. Now, brucellosis, we're free of brucellosis, but you guys live pretty close to Mexico. Mexico's not brucellosis free. The, the river's not a very good border. And so we can get stray cattle. We can get, and, and sometimes, Hogs can carry their own form of brucellosis, swine brucellosis. And so when they're doing market testing, lots of times when they draw blood on your cows, it will react to swine brucellosis. And then you have to do further testing to make sure it's not cattle brucellosis. So that's sort of a pain. If you'll vaccinate your heifers for brucellosis between two and 12 months of age, it says 10, now 12, I'm sorry. Veterinarian has to do that. Uh, then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and you don't have to worry about disease transmission uh, from other source. And then I've got lepto and vibrio. So lepto, vibrio, four-way respiratory in those heifers is what I do at about weaning time. All right, here's my cow herd. This is not my cow herd, but in my cow herd, all right, so this is sort of what I do. We've already talked about clostridials. I do that annually. I only have to do it one time because I gave it to them once and boosted it. Then I do it annually, maybe at preg check time. I give them a four-way respiratory, a five-way lepto, and a vibrio. And ideally, I should do that prior to breeding. But I'll be honest with you, I'll do it at preg check time. Okay, it will it will it will protect the pregnancy. All right, but ideally we need to do it pre-breeding, okay, uh, so that it makes sure that it protects that early pregnancy. Now I don't have scours, okay? I don't have diarrhea in my calves, my calves calf out in the pasture. I don't bring them up in a pen somewhere. But if you calve cows in a pen and you get some really wet conditions and kind of nasty. You could have scours. That's a good time to give the scour vaccine. Okay. So I was going to talk a little bit about some differences and kill different types of vaccines and how they work. These are kill vaccines, and so typically these are black leg vaccines, leptospirosis, vibrio, uh, respiratory diseases can all be killed. Okay, they can. So what we've done is we've heated them up and we've killed them. And the only thing that we're injecting are a bunch of dead cells uh, that are going to have antigens that we're going that the animal's going to have antibodies to. So most of you probably were vaccinated for if you're my age anyway, 50, 50 or older probably, you were vaccinated for smallpox before you were allowed to go to public school. So you have a scar over here on your arm. That was a live vaccine. Okay. Uh, if you had a flu shot. Okay, that's sort of a modified live vaccine. So we actually use different types of vaccines in, in humans as well as in cattle. Uh, nowadays, they give sugar cubes to kids for their, for, their, for their young age. Those are all killed. 
And so typically it takes longer for a killed vaccine to create an immune response, okay? And so that's the difference between killed and modified live or live vaccines. Brucellosis is a live vaccine. That's the reason why your veterinarian has to give it. Okay, you get listed a very good, long lasting response. We only have to vaccinate females for brucellosis one time in their life. For black leg, which is a killed vaccine, we have to do it every year because the immune response is not long lasting. And so, in any time you have any of these vaccines, keep th keep them cool, keep them clean, keep them in the shade. If you read the label, it says you know they're supposed to be between uh, thirty and and fifty five degrees Fahrenheit or thirty five, excuse me, and fifty five degrees, sixty degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure that that they stay cool because as soon as they start to get warm, it starts to kill the product. If it gets too cold, it'll kill the product. Okay, so if you keep these things in a refrigerator, make sure that you have a thermometer there that you can monitor the temperature. The other thing is, is that buy the right amount of vaccines. So vaccines typically come in a 10, or 25 dose or 50 dose. So if you're only going to do 10 cows, all right, don't buy a 25 dose bottle because you think it's cheaper per dose. Well, I'm going to use this much today and four weeks later, I'm going to use the rest of it. Don't do that because as soon as we stick that needle in that vaccine bottle, the very first time we do that, we start to inactivate whatever's still left in that bottle. All right, and so if you only need to vaccinate 10 calves, buy a 10 dose bottle. If you have to vaccinate 20, 20 calves, buy two 10 dose bottles, okay? Or if you buy a 25 dose bottle, don't save the extra five doses because after about two weeks, they're not gonna be anywhere near as good. So only get what you need, use just the right number, okay? Modified live vaccines typically have to be mixed. And so this is an example of a modified live vaccine for the respiratory diseases. We, we generally, and you can buy them in a kill, by the way. You can buy respiratory diseases. You can buy lepto, vibrio, and the respiratory diseases in a kill vaccine. Just remember that they're not gonna stimulate the immune response nearly as quickly and you need to make sure you get that booster in there in three to four weeks, okay? These are modified live vaccines and typically respiratory diseases are modified, can be bought in modified live. Now they'll have lepto as a kill faction and they will have vibrio kill in it, but the respiratory will be modified live. And so over here in this plastic bottle that you see on the right hand side, that's just a thorough diluent. So that's sort of like wall, if you will. And then this is a glass bottle in the middle here. And that glass bottle has got a little cookie down here at the bottom, a little white wafer, all right? And so what we'll do is we'll get a, a needle and we'll take all the fluid out of this bottle and we'll put it in this bottle. And you can use a transfer needle, a transfer needle is simply a needle that has a point on both ends and you stick it in the plastic bottle first and then you turn that bottle over and then you stick it into the glass bottle. All the fluid will flow out of the top into the glass bottle and then you take that glass bottle and you gently shake it okay and you make sure that all the fluid it all dissolves and then so that reconstitutes the vaccine. Now this vaccine will not last forever. You have about two or three hours to use that vaccine. And so you can't take what you don't use and put it back in the refrigerator and use it tomorrow. So only buy what you need, okay? Don't buy any more. Here's sort of an example how kill vaccines work. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, how kill vaccines work. And so this is why we have to have two shots. I think the first shot actually has a much higher level of immune response, 
but it doesn't create long-term resistance until we get this second shot here. Now, this has got what's called a maternal antibody effect. And we used to think that when the mama cow starts producing colostrum, when she first has her calf and she produces that first milk and that baby's sucking on her, she is getting some antibodies from that milk. That's processing into that calf. And that's going to stimulate his immune response or its immune response. And we used to think that if we gave too many shots too soon to that baby calf, that maternal antibody interference was going to reduce, was going to reduce the, the uh, immune response in that calf, and, and it wasn't going to develop good resistance to whatever we gave him an injection. We know that does not the case. I left that in the slide to remind myself to tell you that. So we can actually give black leg shots at about two months of age, okay, and protect that calf until weaning time. So this is just a chart of the shows the different vaccination responses and how they work. The yellow the yellow one is the kill vaccine, which you just saw. Uh, the green one is intranasal. Unfortunately, we don't have we don't have really good intranasal vaccines. We have a couple for respiratory, uh, nasal gin and TSV2, but we just don't have a lot of good respiratory vaccines. But they're very, very good at stimulating good temporary re uh, response in the immune system. But they don't last long, okay? So they're good for stress and for challenged animals like stalker cattle and feed yard cattle coming into the feed yard, but really not for cow cow. And then you can see the red, that's a modified live response. And really we need to have two shots for modified live. Almost all of them recommend it, but if you only get one in, you get really good response. So this is just a diagram of where, where we should be putting these things. So the red, the red uh, four-sided figure here, that's on the anthus animal's neck. And this is for intramuscular or subcutaneous shots only. And remember, she's got two sides. She has a left side and a right side. Lots of times we're working on the left side of the animal, and that's where she gets all the shots. We need to learn to walk around the sheep and get some shots on the other side if we run out of space. And that's true if, if the veterinarian calls, you have a sick animal, and he says, Joe, you got to give 60 cc's of this product, okay, in the muscle. Well, I only can give 10 cc's in a muscle in any one site. And so what I have to do is look up here on the neck and say, okay, I'm gonna give one up here for 10 cc's and one down here for 10 cc's and maybe another one over here for 10 cc's. And then I need to walk around the other side and give the other product, okay? Don't ever give more than 10 cc's in any one spot, unless it's underneath the skin, okay? And so uh, back here down here in the, in the brisket area or the dewlap, you see this yellow box for subcutaneous underneath the skin. So we'll pick up the skin and then we'll stick the needle in. Back here behind the elbow, okay, this is called the elbow pocket. And we can pick up that skin there and stick a needle in. And then up here on the animal's back, this is for pour on or topicals, things that are applied on the back like a dewormer or fly control. And we need to remember that, you know, it starts about right here at the animal's shoulder, but it goes all the way back to their hip, okay? We've got lots of place. And, and rather than just splashing it all on one spot, let's learn to take it and put it all the way out, okay? Because that maximizes the absorption of it, okay? I have a little, we have a little chart and, and sometimes if you have to give a lot of shots, it's helpful to kind of get an idea of how much you need. For most of our vaccines, all right, we're either going to give two cc's or five. Almost none of them say, okay, for a 400 pound animal, you have to give this much. For an 800 pound animal, you give this much. That's typically for vitamins and antibiotics. And so that's why it's good to have a chart like this. 
I like to use either a 16 gauge or an 18 gauge needle. A 16 gauge needle makes a big hole. Uh, 16 gauge needles are found in the gray plastic. They're good for antibiotics and they're good for vitamins because they're very, very thick. And so you need a lot of space to push them through. An 18 gauge needle is smaller than a 16 gauge needle and we find it in a green plastic most of the time. And it's good for almost any sort of vaccine, okay? Uh, and, and, and I have two needle types that I like to use, a one inch and an inch and a half. One inch needle I'll use for calves, for both subcutaneous and intramuscular. Uh, I'll also use a one inch needle for subcutaneous and adult animals. Uh, I'll use the one and a half for intramuscular shots. So I've tried to get away from using 16 gauge needles and gone mostly the eight uh, for vaccines, but I still have to use 16 gauge needles for antibiotics. Never use a needle more than 10 times, okay? And always, so as soon as that needle starts to feel dull, even if it's only used it five or six times, go ahead and change it out. Because a lot of times when we get an injection site knot on the animal's neck, sometimes it's a reaction of the immune system. And it's good because that means that you gave a shot, but sometimes it's because it was a dirty or a dull needle. So never, never reuse needles. Okay, don't 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 use needles today, tomorrow, and buy enough needles that you know if an if it gets dull after six or seven or eight times, you can change it out. But for sure, after every ten. So this is just me giving a subcutaneous shot. This happens to be a black leg shot. It was a it was a five cc product underneath the skin. I lift up the skin there at the animal's neck. Remember, we're going to give all these shots forward of the shoulder, okay? And then I pull, and it does take two hands uh, to do it, but, uh, and, and it does require good restraint, a good shoot, okay? And what you see on an animal's neck are warts, okay? So you can actually get rid of warts a couple of ways. There is a wart vaccines that are out there, but remember, Warts are caused by a virus. You can't get cattle warts, okay? Uh, so you, if you cut, you can cut those off. What I've always done, and it's sort of like witchcraft, is I cut those warts off and I feed them to the animal. Uh, that animal will make its own vaccine, believe it or not. You have to give enough warts. You have to give, you know, four or five, a teaspoonful, okay? but. Lots of times they'll make their own vaccine and it's better to do it when there's just a few of them like they are there than until they get to be really big and massive. And they will bleed when you cut them off. I've heard of people taking a pair of pliers and pinching them. I've heard of people looking at whether with a phase of the moon, uh, haven't worried about the phase of the moon, but I have used them uh, and fed them back to the animal and successfully gotten rid of warts in a lot of cases. So why do vaccines not work? So I just have a list here, okay? Wrong type, wrong time, expired, got hot, got cold. Uh, you threw them up there on the dashboard and ultraviolet radiation got them. You know, we're not, we're, when we talk about animal health, Ivamec, okay, comes in a, comes in a plastic bottle that's sort of see-through, right? It's not, it's not see-through like, like, like this Coke bottle is, okay? It's sort of got sort of a, a sort of occluded, all right? So it's sort of shaded, but it's still sort of a white plastic. The reason why they do that is because ultraviolet radiation from the sun will break down Ivamec. And so we need to be careful about having any vaccine, any anything we're going to inject in the animal exposed to sunlight. Uh, maybe we didn't booster it. Maybe we didn't give enough. Okay, and, th and this is a real deal. So maybe, maybe you were supposed to give two cc's and you're using a big syringe and you really only gave one cc. Use the appropriate size syringe to the dose. So a lot of black leg vaccines only require two cc's. Do not use a 12 cc syringe to give it. Go buy yourself 
a 5cc or 6cc or even a 3cc syringe so you can be very exact in how much you give. Maybe you didn't use the right route. Okay, maybe it said only give subcutaneously and you went intramuscularly or vice versa. Lots of times whether or not an animal is already sick will affect its vaccine response. Okay, and whether or not an animal has mineral issues will affect vaccine response. Okay, so let's talk. Uh, so, any question? Let me stop right there. Is, is any questions about vaccines or about diseases? You can type them or mark. Uh, mark, mark. I don't know if they can if they can respond or raise their hand or they have a question or not. I I, I, I don't know. You like to tell me? Uh, uh, I just got one question on the group chat. That was Norbert, but I took care of that one. Good. Uh, with an, I don't know if Annette is on. I don't know if the participants are able to do that, or as far as uh, yeah, Annette would be the way she, she's hosting the meeting. She's the one that could remove the microphone a little, okay. or maybe you can. I don't know. But well, if you have a question, just type it in. Yeah, and, I'm on. We'll, okay, and we'll go ahead and talk about internal parasites. So, so there's a lot of internal parasites. Uh, and in fact, if you read if you read the label on a on a deworming box, you know this one this one kills 33 or 34, and this one kills 35 or 36. There's only really about a half a dozen that we worry about in Texas, okay? And and, and under good grazing conditions that we're going to talk about later in nutrition, we really don't even have to worry about them too much, okay? Because typically when we get into an overgrazing situation or when cattle are crowded together and they have to eat close to each other's feces, that's when they start reinfesting themselves. That's a big problem in sheep and goats because they groom each other and they eat each other's feces accidentally and then they ingest those parasites. That's not the case of cattle, okay? We actually force cattle, like you see that black heifer up there, She's actually having to eat in a pen that there's already a lot of feces scattered about. And some of those feces could contain parasite eggs. So we worry about Ostratagia, Homonchus, and Trichostrongulus, and then two others that are Cuparia and Nematodirus. All right, so those are the big, big five, if you would, that we worry about stomach worms. And then along the river, okay, in some areas, we'll have liver flukes, and I'll show you what those are. That's the trematodes, fasciola hepatica. That's what y'all have. That's the common cattle fluke. And fortunate, we can kill it pretty easily. Not cheaply, but easily. The other fasciola down there is magna. That's the deer fluke. Now, from about Ricardo North, all the way to Louisiana, we have deer flukes all along say a lot, a lot, 59 to the Gulf Coast, all the way up that way, we have deer flukes. And they get in cattle and they don't realize they're in a cow. They don't wind up in the liver. They could wind up in the lung or the heart or even in the meat. And so typically if an animal slaughtered and it has deer flukes, the entire carcass is condemned because we don't know where they're at. Cattle flukes, that's not a problem. We're always gonna find them in the cow's liver. Uh, cestodes or tapeworms, and not really a big problem in cattle. The other problem that we have down there is the protozoas, and those are coccidia. Now, most of the stomach dewormer, stomach worm products that we use as porons or injectables or paste will not kill the protozoa, will not kill coccidia. Uh, and I've only had one case of coccidia in my entire life. I'm 65 years old. And I had it a year ago, January, in some heifers. I was trying to do some AI work, and I walked out to the I walked out to the pens, and there was bloody scours, and that's a classic sign. So we had had some cold days, and some wet days, and some warm days, and these heifers were up in the pen, and they had been out in the pasture, and they weren't wild; they were just undergoing some physiologic stress because of the environment. One of them had coccidia coccidiosis and uh so i had to treat him and we'll talk about that but so 
It's not very common. It's a big problem in sheep and goats because when we crowd them into a pen somewhere, we can have coccidiosis. But, but in cattle, it's generally not a problem except in feed yard cattle and in stock. Uh, so liver flukes, we talked about the two main types. So uh, the transmission is uh, that, the, uh, that, that the liver fluke, the, the fluke is in, in the cow. She sheds eggs while she's in the liver. It passes out, they pass out in the feces. A cow is, uh, defecates pretty close to a stream or a pond. That feces floats out into the water. And then these little spire sheep, this is what this little beast is right here, microscopic, all right? And it infests this worm. Now, uh, excuse me, snail. Now, it's a specific type of snail. We do have them in the valley. We do have them in the river. You know, if you're four or five miles from the river and it's dry and you don't access the river, you're probably all right. All right, so I'm not trying to tell you that you got a huge problem down there. I'm just saying if you access a, a waterway that flows into the river and you have some really thin cows and, and you've dewormed them and you're feeding them good and they're still wormy or they still look wormy, this could be your problem. Uh, and so this, this liver fluke then, so then, so then what happens is uh, eggs are laid, uh, the cattle, uh, excuse me, the cattle eat the egg, uh, eat the eggs are laid, it, the larvae crawls up on the grass close to the water. Cattle eat the, gra eat the grass, ingest the egg, and then we have the flu. Okay. Uh, we typically deworm or defluke these cattle in May, uh, April or May, and generally in October or November. Unfortunately, we really only have one product that's out there right now, and that is uh, Valbazin. Okay. Uh, we used to have Ivamec F, uh, but, the, but Ivamec F is pretty scarce. And so, you know, it's a drench. And, uh, and I can tell you, you know, it's a lot easier to inject something than it is to drench something. It, the drenching is a lost art in the cow business, let me tell you. Since we have borons and injectables, uh, my daddy, my granddaddy, they knew how to drench cattle. It, it, I had to relearn how to drench cattle when we started using some of these products. Here's what the fluke looks like. Uh, this is this is this is a common fluke, the deer fluke. You can see it's about an inch long by about an inch and a half, about a, about a half an inch in in in, in width. Uh, down here at the bottom, these are deer flukes. Okay, and you can see that they're quite a bit longer. Some of these flukes can be three inch, three inches long as opposed to a, to a deer fluke that, I mean, a cattle fluke that's only about an inch long. So there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, this is the damage they do to the liver over here. They bore holes in there. And this is sort of the representation of uh, where we can find flukes. So you're down, you're down here on the tip of Texas. You're not in what we call an endemic, a, a constantly infected area, but we do have them, okay? Uh, this is coccidia, and this is not the picture that I wanted. I actually had pictures of some heifers that had, had coccidiosis, and, and they just sort of have a real nasty diarrhea. Some of it can be black. Uh, there'll be traces of blood in it, okay? Uh, and it looks like scours, but it's not, it's not dire. It's, it's a blackish with, with tint, with, with red. And so if you look down at the feces, you'll actually see the fecal pads will have some blood in them. That's a classic sign of coccidiosis. You can, you can take a fecal sample and take it to your veterinarian, and this is what they'll show you right here, uh, but, uh, but, but, but you can diagnose it pretty easy. So about the only thing that we can use in cattle is a drench called Corid, uh, C-O-R-I-D. I apologize, this is not the right slide. When I get my PDF file to you, I'll have, a, I'll have that on that slide. It's very expensive. It's like 100, 200 bucks a gallon. But the good news is that it's mixed with water and, and it's very effective. When I was treating those cattle, I had about a dozen heifers in a pen. I treated them all for five days with this product and then I, I and, but I isolated the one heifer that I realized that had the worst case. 
and I treated her differently. And then I went through the pen, and this is a pain, okay? But I went through the pen and picked up all the manure that I could find, and or I sprayed it with bleach water, and I sprayed all those heifers with ble bleach water. That's very effective. And I sprayed all the pens with bleach water uh, because I wanted to get them bred, and I did. Out of those twelve heifers, we got a lot of them, eleven, eleven of them bred to AI. Even the even the heifer that was affected with coccidiosis got bred. So, uh, but what happens is that coccidia destroy the lining of the small intestine. And the small intestine is where most of the absorption occurs. So all the nutrients that are created and digested in the rumen, okay, that are not absorbed in the omason and abomason, okay, are absorbed in the small intestine. So there's about 30 or 40 feet of small intestine that absorb nutrients. And if we destroy the small intestine, all right, then we have scour. And that's what that's what causes that's what causes. So the walls of the small intestine, that's what you see down here at the bottom, typically have got a bunch of little finger-like projections, just like you see my fingers here. And so if you can imagine them all around, and the food flows through there, and it greatly increases the surface area. When we have an infection in the in small intestine like coccidia, those slough off and they're gone, and then suddenly the small intestine just looks like a tube and there's no projection and there it just passes on through without being absorbed. That's also what happens when a dog has distemper, by the way. Same same effect. So the, I, this is just a slide that has a bunch of the different different uh, different uh, parasites, but uh, but almost anything that you use today, whether it's a pour on, an injectable, or a drench. Or if you use a cube or a block that has like safeguard in it, those are going to get the big four or five parasites that we're worried about in terms of stomach worm. They will not kill they will not kill liver flukes, and they won't kill coccidia. But most of the, almost anything that you use, okay, with good grazing management will impact your stomach worm problem, unless you have a severe problem. Okay, so this is just a list. A lot of people ask me, Joe, I've only got five or six cows. Uh, can I use one of those safeguard blocks? Why, sure. But just remember that a safeguard block, that 40 pound block, is to be eaten by eight 1,000 pound cows. So if you have more than 8,000 pound cows, you're gonna need more than one block. And they're very safe, so say, say I have Let's pick a number. Let's say I have 10 cows and they, and they all weigh 1,200 pounds each. So I have 12,000 pounds of cows. I can put two blocks out there and it's safe. Or I can use a bag, a safeguard bag of crumbles that you can feed. And typically those are for 8,000 pounds. I can put two of those out. Very safe product, okay? So some points of, to consider, you know, uh, use name brand products. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but I think it's very important. We have to be careful since since the uh, the trademark or the patent no longer applies to Ivamec. There's been a large number of Ivamec type products. Okay, they're cheaper, all right, but they're not as good. And I'm not talking about the brand name. So Ivamec, Ivamec F, Epronex. Uh, Duramectin, Doramectin, uh, Cydectin, uh, those are all trade name products, all right? But, but, uh, but if you come in with uh, some other brand, you just need to be careful. Uh, Levamisol is an old dewormer that we used to use and is still being used in sheep and goats, uh, but it's not nearly as effective. Totalon was, was the name of that product. So Oxfendazole, uh, Finbendazole, Albendazoles, I call those the white dewormers. And so Safeguard, Panicure, those are white dewormers that are very good. Uh, they used to come as paste, they're used as drenches. Once again though, you gotta catch their head and they have, and you have to use a drench gun, So and you have to catch them when they're gonna swallow that stuff because it's bitter, all right? And you don't want them to spit it out. They're still very effective. 
ivermectin, doramectin, moxidectin, and prinomectin. Those are all very effective. And to me, there's no difference in the effectiveness of any of those products, okay? Of the, of the macrocyclic lactones, okay? No evidence of resistance developing in cattle. There is in sheep and goats, but not in cattle. There is in horses, but not in cattle. Uh, some of these can be used, some of these forms can be used for horn fly control. That's fine, but don't reduce the rate that you're applying them. Use them as if you're going to treat them for, for worms, not, and, and it's very expensive. There's much cheaper porons for dewormers. Okay. And remember to follow the label and, and withdrawal times. So here's just some ideas about controlling internal parasites. Okay. Think about what it is that you're going to treat. Uh, when, when you work with your veterinarian, they may recommend that you start doing some fecal testing. And that's a good idea. So you go out and you get some fecal pads, you use a, a, like a baggie, you turn it inside out and you go around and you grab some fresh fecal samples and you send it in and they'll look to see what kind of worms you might have by looking at the eggs and then recommend treatment. That's good. That's very strategic. You may find out you don't have to treat all the time. Okay. Uh, nutrition. Animals that are in better body condition, that are fatter, tend to be less susceptible to stomach worms. Older cows tend to be less susceptible. Brahmin influence cattle tend to be less susceptible. That doesn't mean that they're immune, okay? It means that they may have some parasites and it doesn't bother them. But that's not true for young cattle. Young heifers, young calves, okay? Though they are very susceptible, and so we used, I used to tell people, if you're not going to deworm your calves, okay, don't deworm your cows. What that means is, is that you're going to kill all the parasites in your cows, and that's basically going to keep them from them from contaminating your pasture. But your biggest bang for your buck is in is in treating the parasites in those young animals because they're going to gain better. Okay, uh, pasture management, pasture rotation is so important. And I know it's difficult sometimes for smaller producers to rotate cattle to divide their pastures up. But even putting a hot wire across a 20 acre trap and leaving cattle on this side for a week or two weeks and then moving them to the other side for a week or two weeks helps reduce parasite infestation and improve pasture growth. Ideally, we'd like to see about a three to four week rest rotation between pastures because those worms don't live forever. When that, when, that, when that egg is in that manure and she'll shed, mama worm can shed five, six, seven, 10,000 eggs a day in the manure pad. Fortunately, not all of them survive, but the ones that do crawl out of that manure pad and they don't crawl three or four feet. They may crawl a few inches to a grass stem, and then they'll crawl up that grass stem maybe a couple of inches and hope that a cow comes along and eats it, and then it'll develop into a worm. Well, if it doesn't come by in the next couple of days and eat it, then it's dead. It dries out. Ultraviolet radiation burned it up, okay? And so that's why it's important for grazing distribution and for pasture management. And that worm didn't live forever. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you have low risk pastures, you know, that, that you've been out, put, put your young cattle in there first. Chances are there will be a less worm burden, okay? Uh, and so there's just some thoughts there that I have. Graze pastures with, with older animals. So if you have a high risk pasture out there that that you think that, you know, man, I've, I've only been off of it a few days, but man, that grass has really grown. I got good rainfall. You know, put those older animals in there. Utilize it. Don't, 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 don't turn those young animals in. Uh, uh, allow grass to grow taller, right? So, you know, we've all, we, we, we've all kind of gotten in the habit of when we have Bermuda grass, we want to graze it as close as we can to the ground. Well, the problem is that's where the parasites are. Fortunately, with grasses like buffalo grass and klein grass and even king ranch blue stem, okay, those are bunch grasses, 
we don't have we don't graze those grasses nearly as close and so those bunch grasses actually help us keep our parasite load down burning pasture helps reduce worm burden as well as thick burden as well and of course breaking up and removing remove manure pasture that's not always possible okay so that's sort of the internal parasite i know we're that took about an hour what I'd like to do is kind of visit with you a little bit about some external parasites. And uh, if that's good, do we have any questions? Marcos, are we okay so far? We are okay. Uh, not on the chat anyway, no questions. I don't know if anybody okay. has anything. Okay, well, got a couple of things. So we're, I want to talk a little bit about external parasites because, you know, this is an issue that we all have. So there's a couple of things on this on this on this slide I want to point out. One here at the very top, uh, that's a website that's put together by a specialist colleague of ours who is an entomologist, a uh, Dr. Sonia Swigert, and so this is her website, Livestock Vet Ento Veterinary Entomology, and she has a bunch of information on there, uh, and one of them is this bulletin that she put together. Uh, but rather than having to go to her website and pick it up, I'll direct you to a real simple one, beef.tamu.edu. And under the health section, you can download this publication for free. Mark, you may have it on your website. It's about a one megabyte publication, so it's pretty big. It's about the size of a picture that you might take on your phone. So it takes a minute to download, but you can download it to your computer or print it off. But uh, she has all the major external parasites for beef cattle in that publication. Uh, and then there's an app, a little app that you can get for your cell phone, uh, a tick app, and it's put together by Dr. Pete Teal. Dr. Teal is an entomologist who works for the research side. And it has an app, it's a little app that will help you identify ticks on your dog, on you, on your cattle, uh, on horses. And uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not good enough that you take a picture of the tick, but you open up the tick app and you just sort of scroll down to look for a tick that looks like yours. But nonetheless, it's a pretty good app. So we're just gonna run through some of these. Uh, I've got some general comments that I'm gonna make, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. Uh, I can tell you that in general, the, the ones that I worry about more than anything else are horn flies, okay, and ticks. Ticks in general. And, uh, and we'll talk about those. So there's a lot of different management tips here. And the same thing that we talked about grazing management, in terms of pasture rotation, pasture rest that applies here. So, you know, proper grazing management will help you with reduce this external parasite problem. Uh, cleaning up litter, manure piles around the barns and your pens and corrals because some of these like litter, they like trash, they like to be in wet spots. Uh, brush control will help a lot because lots of times these parasites, they like to be where it's cool. Where is it cool in August? Okay, underneath those mesquite trees in that little brush mop. Uh, prescribed fire helps a lot because all these, all these critters drop eggs and larvae on the ground. And unless a fire ant comes along and picks them up and gets them, okay, they're gonna become a parasite and fire will help this as well. So the first one we're gonna talk about is face flies. Uh, back when the dairy, we used to have a lot of dairies in the valley when I was a kid. I'm from Kingsville, uh, worked at a dairy down in Laferia back when I was in high school for a while. And uh, so, you know, we used to have some smaller dairies, not, not big dairies, but everybody had, had some Jersey cows and, and, and milk back when we had milk processors down there. Uh, and so this is mainly a problem with a lot of dairy cows. Don't have much in, in, in cattle, but you might see them. These are face flies, they're about the size, they're about the size of a house fly, but they are face flies in cattle. They like to drink the fluids around the eye and around the muzzle. Uh, they're responsible for the transmission of pink eye, okay? There is a vaccine for it, for pink eye. If you have pink eye, it's mostly on 
white faced cattle like you see on this Hereford here. Uh, but, uh, and, and we do have them on horses as well. So probably a bigger problem in horses uh, than it is in cattle for most of you. Uh, so down here at the bottom, this is some stuff that I found at, uh, at TSC. It's not a commercial, but you know, these are, you can see that they're just little tubes, right? So they're, they have about two cc's of product or maybe a little bit more. And so what they do is they recommend that you follow the directions. You put a half a cc here and a half a cc here and a half a cc over here. Uh, in particular, on, I realize you can't do it on cows, but on horses, it works extremely well. Uh, stable flies, so these, we have two, two types of flies that I call armored flies. So it looks like they have armor on them. Stable flies is one of them. Uh, and, and I call them armored flies because, you know, you can slap them and knock them to the ground and they just sort of shake themselves off and they get up and they fly off again. Uh, so this is one of them. You typically see it down here around the legs. And the reason why you see them down here or sometimes you'll see them on the belly like on this old beef master cow here is that the skin is much thinner. Okay, so the hide is much thicker up here and here. But down here, it's much thinner. And down here on the legs, it's much thinner. And that's because there's a lot of vascular system, a lot of blood cells, because that's where heat exchange occurs around the legs and down underneath the belly. And so they know that. And so that's where you'll see them gather. And they basically, they just rip up the skin. Okay. And they drink blood. They like wet areas. So this beef master cow was down in the creek bottom of my old place. And there's a lot of litter down there. And in the springtime, you know, when those cows are down there, they gather up a lot of these stable flies. We call them stable flies, um, uh, but it's because we'd find them in stables on horses. Okay. Uh, they can transmit anaplasmosis, which is a bloodborne disease. We didn't talk about that in the, our diseases. But we do have anaplasm. There is a good vaccine for it. They transmit anthrax. Y'all don't have anthrax down that part of the country. Uh, they do transmit infectious equine, equine infectious anemia or Potomac horse fever. Y'all do have that, okay, in horses. Uh, and so it's important to control these flies. Unfortunately, there's not much products. And I'm going to go back to this product right here. This product is, was very effective in controlling these flies on horses, okay, on horses. This is the other one. <clears throat> this is the one that we, see, that we see on horses, stable fly. It's a little bit smaller. I mean, horse fly. It's a little bit smaller uh, to me than the stable fly, but they're very active. Uh, one thing that makes this fly different, so thinking about the life cycle, of the type of fly, what it feeds on, when it feeds, uh, these only the females bite okay the guy the male flies like to eat nectar uh these flies are active in the daylight they like to rest at night uh, they like damp spoil air so if you got a pen that you're keeping your horses in or a stall and the water's overflowing you have sort of a little wet area in the stall ideal place for them to breed and to lay eggs and they can transmit very similar diseases as, as our stable fly. And once again, I'll go back to that product from TSC. Uh, this particular product, any of these products right here were very effective, not only controlling face flies, uh, actually it controlled all flies. It even controlled horn flies. So any of those three products, I tried them all. I've used them on horses. I've used them on cattle, sort of in home demonstration trials. And, and they've all been effective uh, in controlling all these flies. So this is a horn fly. This is one we think about as being the biggest pest, and it is. Interestingly enough, we imported it from Europe. So just, just like we've imported the, the, the coronavirus from China, we imported these guys uh, when we brought cattle over from Europe. Uh, they are, they love cattle. Uh, you know, we used to call them horn flies because when cows had horns, typically we'd see them up here around the horn base. Now we've taken the horns off most of our cows, and so they've adapted to other areas. And particularly along the back, when it gets too hot, they move underneath the belly. And uh, 
and it's surprising how fast we can get a horn fly population. So uh, down here at the bottom, this is a Charlotte, one of my Charlotte calves from years ago uh, at the ranch, and uh, and and I used to go out there almost every day and uh, and 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 check on the cattle, and I'd been gone for two or three days, and and it really hadn't rained or anything, and I drove down the ranch road there, and I looked at that calf, and I thought. Where in the world did that calf get all that mud from? And I backed up and looked at it, and I realized that's horn flies. And in about three or four days, he had gone from no horn flies to what you see there. So it didn't take them very long uh, to have a horn fly. And you guys know that. You guys run cows, you, you understand that. Problem with the horn fly is that it takes a blood meal about 20 to 40 times a day, every one of them. And, uh, they reproduce in fresh manure, so the mama, mama horn fly comes in and sticks her ovipositor down there in a relatively fresh manure pad. She will lay about 10,000 eggs. Once again, fortunately, they don't all hatch. Uh, but when they do, you sort of see a swarm. Everybody's probably gone out and looked at in their pasture and seen a manure pile out there that looked like it had a bunch of holes in it, okay? Looked like somebody had shot it with a shotgun or taken an ice pick and knocked a bunch of holes in a dry manure pad. That's exactly what it looks like when you see all these horn flies emerge. Uh, they do transmit a disease called stephanofilariasis, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. There's a lot of different treatments that you can use. Some people use a pour-on, uh, some people use dust bags. I've gone back to using a, uh, a, a back rub. I charge it with vegetable oil, and an insecticide, and it's very effective. I also use ear tags uh, because I have a tick problem, and so I use tags for the ticks as well as the flies. Uh, there is a vet gun uh, that they use, you know, that basically looks like a paint gun. So, but but main thing is a combination treatments is really best for for these for these for these flies. We don't have many of these anymore, but, but, I, but I brought this up because I saw a case uh, up around Rio Grande City a few years ago. It was an imported case. So these are grubs, cattle grubs. It's what they look like when they're emerging out of the animal's back. I borrowed this picture from a friend of mine. So typically about this time of the year, the flies would, would hatch, they would come out. They wanna lay their eggs on the lower on the lower legs of the cow. Uh, the cows hear the fly buzzing around and they start running and they go look for a tank to stand in and they won't get in a tank all the way. They just basically get in till about the bottom of their belly so their legs are covered because the only place this fly can lay its eggs is in the lower leg, okay? And so if it's covered up with water, she can't lay her eggs. And, uh, Widespread use of Ivamec began in about 1986, 87, 88, and fire ants pretty much eliminated cattle grubs from the southern part of the United States. But we are starting to see some cattle grubs come in from the north and the northwest. We have some in like in San Angelo and Abilene. Not a bit, a lot of cases, but they're starting to come back. And I just sort of brought this up so that you can kind of, in case you get cattle from those areas, or in case you see this, this is what you see. So this is what the grub looks like uh, as it's emerging. And this is actually a picture of a grub uh, from that Rio Grande City herd. Those cattle actually came from uh, from Colorado. Uh, they uh, the, the flies lay their eggs on the animal in the springtime. Uh, they emerge that like you see down here uh, in the fall. Yeah. And there's a lot of different products that are after. Fortunately, most of the Ivamec products will take care of this. Ivamec pour-on, Ivamec injectable uh, will take care of this. But I just brought it up so that you would uh, you would you would know something about it. Dr. Pascal. Yes. Shoot. We have a question uh, from okay. Sam Garito. Uh, which brand of ear tag do you recommend? Okay, Sam. There's a whole bunch of different kinds that are out there. Uh, you know what I would do is I would I would rotate. So I'm using Terminator right now. That I think that's an orange tag, and then they have Combat. So what I what I try to do I'm looking for a tick tag first off for me. So I have to make sure ticks are on the label, and then what I try to do is I try to rotate Combat. So one time I'll use a Permethrin, another time I will use a different organophosphate, 
and then I might use a lambdo sahasrin. I have a hard time pronouncing that word. <laughs> but I try to rotate products at least every other season. I try not to use the same product two seasons in a row. Okay? Thank you. You bet. So can't do much about mosquitoes, to be honest with you, except try to avoid those areas. But I just stuck them in there because they are a pest. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some ticks. Uh, this is a soft tick, uh, or spinose ear tick. When I was a kid, this used to be a big problem. Uh, they get down deep inside the animal's ear, uh, cause a lot of nerve damage, and sort of instead of the ear standing up straight out, it would flop down. Uh, a lot of nerve damage. And then at the same time that we had these ticks, we used to have a little pest called the screw worm. And so then the screw worm fly would get in there, and then we'd have a real mess. Uh, I have a mech, I think, and fire ants have pretty well eliminated this pest, although I have some people that have told me that they're starting to see some ear ticks. But, so typically when you see hard ticks, these are soft ticks, typically when you see hard ticks, okay, we see those ticks out here on the rim of the animal's ear, okay? Those are hard ticks, or maybe down here on the neck or on other places of the body. These ticks get down deep inside the animal's ear, okay? So that's the difference that we see there. These are the hard ticks, and we have a whole bunch, okay? Um, this actually comes from, this picture actually comes from Dr. Teal's tick app that we talked about earlier. Up here at the top, uh, these are lone star ticks. If I can get, there we go. So these are lone star ticks. The females are on the right-hand side, the males are on the left, and she's called a lone star because she's got that little dot right there. The male does not have it, okay, but he does have some some sort of white patterns that you see here. This is the Gulf Coast tick, and, it, and this is not a really good picture, but both the male and the female sort of look like they have a little, a little camouflage pattern. So it looks like, you know, they have some dungarees on that have a little camouflage pattern. Now these guys down here are ticks that you hope that you never have, all right? So these are our cattle fever ticks. Uh, the top tick is our is our southern cattle fever tick, and the bottom one is the tropical cattle fever tick. Typically, we see these ticks along the river around Laredo and north, and these ticks we see along the river from Laredo and south to your area. Uh, if you want to look at these particular ticks, okay, you see that the nose is extremely short on these ticks. Or as you look up here, the nose of the proboscis, okay, sort of like my nose, is extremely long, okay? And so when you pull, when you pull a Lone Star tick or a Gulf Coast tick off of you, you almost feel it, you, feel, you, you see the skin sort of pick up and you can almost hear it go pop, pop when you pull them off. I, I exaggerate, but you get the idea. On these ticks, the cattle fever ticks, Okay, these ticks basically just roll off. Okay, so when USDA or Animal Health Commission tick force comes along inspecting cattle and they're scratching cattle, the reason why they scratch them, they're really not scratching, they're just sort of dragging their fingernails over the skin because that's how easy these ticks come off. And that's the reason why those ticks like to be up underneath the back legs or under the belly underneath the foreleg, you know, because they're very easy, they, they come off very easy. The other difference between almost all these other ticks and these two ticks is that when you get them off and you put them in your finger, you put them in the palm in your hand, those cattle fever ticks, they don't move very fast. I guarantee you, you pull a, a brown dog tick off your dog or a lone star tick off a cow, and it's starting to hustle. It's moving. Okay, and so that's why it's important to look at these ticks and, you know, you guys are right there, you know, you're on the border. We do have cattle fever ticks on the other side of the river. We do have cattle fever ticks along the permanent quarantine zone or the systemic, systematic area. And occasionally, I know Ponce in Cameron County, you guys have got it in the National Wildlife, you have them in the National Wildlife Refuge. And so it's easy for those ticks to move around. 
on on wildlife, on deer, not on hogs, uh, not on undocumented aliens or whatever we call them now, immigrants. Uh, and not on hogs, not on people, but they do move on deer and they do move on nail guy. And so be observant for ticks, okay? Almost anything kills them. Uh, I do know the Animal Health Commission and, uh, and uh, USDA Veterinary Services, the tick force, is using uh, Dura, uh, uh, Tectomax injectable as a treatment for ticks every uh, 25 days. And I do know that they're using Ivamec in the corn feeders for the deer. Uh, and there's some talk about them using it as a pour on. It's not labeled for ticks for our use, but apparently they are, are using it. It does have some, some, uh, some efficacy, some effect on ticks. Uh, outside of the fever ticks, all those other ticks we talked about, the brown-legged dog tick, the Lone Star tick, the Gulf Coast tick, the cayenne tick, which you guys do have, very elongated tick. They care, they transmit a large number of diseases. Anaplasmosis is just one of them, okay? Uh, and they, they transmit pyroplasmosis in horses. And so it's just important to pay attention to treat for ticks. If you have purebred cattle, the biggest problem that ticks create is that particularly when they get up here on their ears, they cause a lot of hair loss. They cause a lot of scabbing. And so the, 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 it reduces the attractiveness. If you're trying to sell a bull or some replacement heifers or a show animal and, and, and they've had ticks, they don't have any hair on the top of their ears, it sort of, it sort of takes away from their eye appeal. Uh, this is something you guys all see, but uh, this is the, the fever tick report that's available at the Texas Animal Health Commission. And uh, down there at the bottom there on the, on the eastern side of Cameron County, uh, you guys can see that that's basically uh, the, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Reserve there. Uh, and this is actually, in, was, actually this is their most current but uh, map that I get, but uh, that'll show you. Each one of those green stars represents an infected premise back in September outside the permanent quarantine zone. Each one of those red stars represents uh, an, a premise inside and and if you notice, we have one in Jim Wells County, okay? It's not a very, a very big area. It's only two premises that have been identified in Jim Wells County. Uh, they drew about a six mile radius around, uh, excuse me, a four mile radius, uh, I'll get this straight, a two mile radius. So it's four miles across away from those two premises. The problem is, as you guys know, they found 450 different landowners they had to go talk to and inspect livestock on. Okay, and essentially in about 4,000 acres. So that's the problem, we just, just manpower. Uh, one tick I wanna keep, keep you apprised of, it's a relatively new tick. It actually comes from Southeast Asia. They call it the Longhorn Tick, and it's not because it went to the University of Texas. It's because when you flip that tick over on the bottom side on its breastplate, it's got sort of like what looks like a long, long horn on the bottom, on, on its breastplate. Uh, we don't have it in Texas yet, but, uh, but a lot of states do have it. The problem with it is, is that it's a parthenogenic. That's a 25 cent word for meaning that it doesn't need a male to reproduce, okay? So females can reproduce themselves. It transmits a lot of different diseases. Uh, down there at the bottom, it says tags, injectables, and porons are not as effective, question mark. Nobody knows, okay? Uh, but that's why it's important. You got a tick that you don't know anything about, take it to your regional veterinary office, okay? Your APHIS office, animal health office, or bring it by your county agent, okay? And we'll get it identified. Lice, uh, a lot of folks worry about lice. Uh, a lot of people think they have lice. And really what they have is what I call uh, a horn fly dermatitis. So if we have a big horn fly problem in the summertime and we don't treat it, lots of times we'll see dermatitis. We'll see these animals scratching and rubbing on a mesquite tree or a post in the wintertime. We go up there and look for lice nits and we don't see any lice. We don't see any lice eggs. We don't see any lice larvae. And that's caused by horn fly dermatitis. But there are species of lice that we can see, the one biting lice, and that's that beast you see right there in the middle. 
he doesn't have any real long nose, it's sort of blunt, that means he bites, okay? And then we have four sucking, okay? So these are all the sucking lice down here, three of the four, and you can see that they have a lot longer nose, okay? And so that means that they burrow into the skin and they suck blood. And uh, entomologists are funny guys, people that study bugs, you know, so uh, they, they've got hog nose lice and they have tail lice. And, and of course, this guy right here, he's a blue lice. Uh, and so this is a Charlay heifer at my place a few years ago. And this is tail lice, okay? So lice are like flies, like any other parasite. They like to go to a specific place. That's where they evolve. And that's why we sort of identify, okay? So here's the tail lice down here. This is this guy right here. So his colleagues were up here on his tail, okay? And so fortunately, most of the products that we use to control horn flies, control lice. So any of the porons that we use, whether we use them to deworm cattle or whether they use them just to treat horn flies, okay, they'll work. And by the way, if you just have a horn fly problem, there's a lot of porons that are specifically for horn flies. Some of them will kill ticks, some of them will kill flies, some of them will kill grubs, but they're so much cheaper than using a poron to kill stomach worms and horn flies. So pay attention to that. One of the products that I use not a, uh, is a promethean based product. It's called Silence, C Y L E N C E. I don't get any honorarium, okay? But I like to use it. It's easy to use. It's like four cc's on a calf, weighs less than 400 pounds. Four to 800 pounds, it's eight cc's. And anything above that, it's 12. And it's very safe to use and it's very effective. And I use it. That knocks down my population. I stick an ear tag in their ear and that helps me control the population for a while. And then they go out to a back rubber somewhere. And so I'm using a combination of approaches on my external parasite problem, and, and, and it cheapens it up. You say, well, that, 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 that horn fly tag or that fly tag, it's like $3. Do I have to use both of them? Probably not if you're using a combination of methods to treat your approach, okay? This is what horn flies can cause, Steph, uh, stephanofilariasis. So this is on some Charlotte heifers that I was breeding several years ago. I came home after being to a county program for a couple of days and I had about a dozen of these beautiful white heifers out there and they were bloody. From about their navel back to their tail head, you can see along that underline right here, they had just raked themselves raw. This is after I had sort of washed it off and cleaned it up a little bit, but this was the day that it occurred. And I looked through my pins, I looked through a piece of wire for or a piece of metal or some place that they could have rubbed themselves raw, couldn't find anything. I found some wooden troughs that I used that they had actually scraped themselves raw because what had happened is that these horn flies carried this parasite, went into the blood, and during the fall, the late fall, December, January, these parasites migrate to the midline and they cause such a tremendous itching that these cows will go somewhere and just scrape themselves raw. And then this was after about two weeks, and you can see it sort of healed up a little bit, and it was start, starting to make, you know, sort of a scar, a keloid. And I know that you guys have all seen these out in cattle out in South Texas. I've seen them since I was a kid. You go out there and you look at an old beef mass cow or old Brayford cow or Bramer cow that's out there, and you look underneath their underline, and you see a big old scar. That's what causes it. And so, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of a problem when it happens, uh, it, it, and it happens regularly. And, and on purebred cattle, it's, it's, it's sort of a blemish. So you want to make sure that you don't get this in your purebred cattle. It's a problem that we have mostly in the South. No product is labeled to kill these things, but almost anything that we use in terms of a poron will kill them, okay? And so most of the most of the organophosphates that we use as porons that are systemic uh, will help kill, but the main thing is control horn flies, okay? Control, control horn flies. We don't have mites anymore, you guys would think mites. We think about uh, mites and scabies. We think about mange. Uh, uh, we don't have moat bitten mainly because we're using so much ivamex. Ivamex is a tremendous product. 
So uh, kind of my thought, final thoughts here, identification is important to know something about the parasite. What is it you're trying to control? What's its life cycle? Where does it hang out, okay? Uh, most of the methods that are out there are gonna control more than one pest, just like most deworming products will kill more than one worm. Uh, think about long-term versus short-term. So yeah, I wanna kill this right now, but I'm, it's gonna be a recurring problem. So what, what's, what can I best use to kill this thing over time? Uh, you want to have a quick knockdown. So I remember when I was a kid, we had those old 250-gallon red sprayers. You'd crank that motor up, you know, you have 100 foot of hose, and you get out there and you're spraying cattle, right? And uh, and so we got to where what happened? You got you got all the cattle. Where were all where where were all the flies? They were on you, right? And and that stuff never lasted. You know, next week, two weeks later, they'd all be back. You know, and so we knew that we were starting to get some resistance to those products. Uh, also think about withdrawal, okay? Uh, because some of these products do have a withdrawal time. And uh, and I stuck a little deal in about Brahmin breed effects. So some of these products like Warbex, which is used to treat grubs, okay, can cause nerve issues in Brahmin cattle. And do not treat young animals, okay? Do not treat young animals. So just sort of a quick rundown. There's an the ear tag you see right there. It's a a horn fly tag and a tick tag. Uh, down here we see a veterinarian applying a pour on, okay, a horn fly control pour on. Uh, down here at the bottom, this is actually down near Rondado. Uh, that this this dipping vat's no longer there. This was an old uh, community dipping vat uh, to treat for ticks. But while you're treating for ticks, you can kill horn flies. You can kill you know anything just about. Uh, the reason why they this 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 that was uh, was taken out of commission. It's because uh, there's no way to control exactly how much product is in this vat. It's not covered. It's not tested. Uh, it's not cleaned. And so all the Animal Health Commission vats, all the USDA vats, the permanent vats, they're all tested to make sure that the amount of product in there is adequate, that it's not too little or too much, and make sure that it's clean. They protect it from rainfall and um, recharge them frequently uh, and, and of course they're using spray boxes as well and there are some adjustments to those spray boxes to allow more ventilation and then of course they're using Dectamax and other things so uh, up here at the top this is a this is a bag a dust bag dust bags work great uh, I don't like them uh, personally because you know if you get them high enough to work for your bulls you don't get your calves dusted if you get them too low for your calves then they figure out that there's dust in them and they're playing in it. And then of course, then they're too low really to do an effective job on bulls and cows. This is a back rubber, it's not my cows. I should put a picture of my cows in here. But uh, so this is a back rubber and it's basically just a, uh, a sock, a large cotton sock filled with, uh, with the old clothes. Uh, that's how we used to make them, uh, old cotton, wrap them in burlap around a chain. And then we take a motor oil, burn motor oil, and mix it up with an insecticide and do, but don't do that anymore. Motor oil, petroleum products are not labeled for cattle. And so now what I use, I use about three or four gallons of vegetable oil. I find myself a big plastic tub, sort of like what this mineral feeder's in right here. And I mix that product together and then I pour, put that, put that uh, back rubber in there. And then when I go to recharge it, I mix up a little product, put it in a gallon bucket with a paintbrush, and then I paint it on this thing. And it work, works really well. And then down here at the bottom, this is a mineral feeder that also has a horn fly. And I didn't mention this earlier, and I apologize. There's an insect growth regulator used with horn flies called Altacid. It's an IGR, insect growth regulator. And what it does is it keeps horn flies once they hatch out of the eggs in the, in, in the manure and their larvae, they eat this alphacid that the cows eat, pass out in the manure, and they remain teenagers. They never develop into be mature flies. It's expensive, but it's another method to think about in terms of overall insect control. So I'm gonna stop right there, Marcus. I know I've talked for about an hour and a half. Uh, people might need to go to the bathroom and get a cup of coffee, but if, if it's all right, we'll just,
Well, let's take about a five or 10 minute break. We have any questions, I'll get those. And then we'll start with the, with the second part, which is nutrition and feeding. Sounds good. We'll do, go ahead and take a little five, 10 minute break. And if anybody has any questions, uh, let us know. Uh, uh, write them or speak or whatever, and we'll, and we'll, we'll answer them. But I'm going to get a cup of coffee and take a potty break, okay? I'll be right back. All right. I think I'm going to do the same thing. Ta -da. Ta -da 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 -da. Like I scared myself, saw myself with a mask on. <clears throat> Let's see here. Oops. While you're setting up there, Dr. Pascal, I'm going to give them a little quick update. Uh, my next session I'm hoping for is going to be May 28th. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be the same uh, format on the Zoom. Seems to be working pretty good. And I don't see us being able to meet in person, you know, by that time anyway. But I'm going to try to 
to schedule the session that we had to cancel back in March for the May 28th session, which is the weed and brush control with Dr. Megan Clayton, if I can hopefully get her scheduled, and, and uh, Holly Davis, who's our new entomologist in Wessico, uh, talking about, I guess, uh, pest management in, in pastures. And then I think I had a Pepe Martinez over from Kingsville, NRCS, to talk about uh, pasture establishment and management. So I'm gonna try to redo that second session that we had to cancel because of all the pandemic thing that was happening at that time and schedule it for May 28th. So just kind of be looking at your emails and we'll get you guys uh, hopefully updated on, on what the plan is for the future. Thank you. We got everybody back. Are we good? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, what we th thought we'd do now is sort of transition a little bit, talk about a little bit about nutrition. And, and, so, and so rather than actually tell you, you know, how much to feed and things like that, I thought we'd just kind of visit about what cows need and, and sort of how to determine what it is that you need to do. Uh, and this is, I, I meant to say this earlier, so I, 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 I realize it's a little difficult sometimes just sit and listen to somebody talk. So I try to be a little bit more expressive in, uh, in, in some, some of these things. But to me, you know, this is my neighbor's cows, by the way. Uh, the uh, pasture condition, think about what it is, you know, before you go buy cubes or go buy a tub or whatever it is that you're going to do, you know, here's some things to think about. What are your pasture conditions? What are they now? What's it going to look like three months, six months from now? Where, where are you at? Uh, are you going to get more rain? Uh, are you not going to, have you not had any rain? Uh, you know, those are things that are important. Well, sort of what's the grazing habits of your cattle right now? And, 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 wh and what have they been? I've got a little chart in here somewhere that kind of shows how animals, how animals graze relative to the pasture quality and quantity. But everybody knows that, you know, when you turn cows out into, into a fresh pasture, you know, they all sort of congregate together and they all sort of move together as a herd. And the longer they're in it, you know, the more they sort of spread out, you know. Uh, they're, they're always going to come back to a spot that's where the ice cream is, where the best plants are. They're going to tend to overgraze that if you're not careful. Uh, and so, you know, think about the grazing apps. How early do they get up to go eat? All right. When do they take their siesta? Okay. When do they get up after the siesta and how late do they graze at night? So, you know, think about, you know, what your cattle are doing. Uh, we talked about weather conditions. We'll visit a little bit about fecal pads. I'm a big proponent of looking at fecal pads. Uh, we used to have an ag economist here, he's retired now, uh, Mac Young. And uh, Mac said that in the final 15, 16 years he worked with me, he had never heard me give a talk that I didn't mention fecal pads. Uh, but I, I think it's very important. Body condition, fatness of the cow, and then sort of what's the, what's the physiologic status of that, of that cow? Is she bred? Is she open? Is she long bred? Is she short bred? Is she lactating? Those kinds of things. So I'm going to start with pasture conditions. And I actually took this picture. This is a heifer that I took a picture of about 25 years ago uh, near Lynn, Texas. She was out there in a, during a drought. And, uh, and uh, she, she and her colleagues out there, pretty, pretty slim pickings. Good looking little heifer, but she was she just didn't have much to eat. So, you know, what evaluate your pasture. And this is where a, this is where a cell phone comes in handy. Almost all of our cell phones today can take pictures. While you're taking a picture of your cow, make sure you take a picture of that pasture. And I've owned a place in Jim Wells County for about 20 years, and I have pictures from the very first day I bought that place until the day I sold it. And it's amazing to see the changes in that place over that time. And I think that that's very important. Get an idea because your memory doesn't, your memory is not good. Your memory only remembers what it looked like a long time ago and what it looks like today, not what the changes in between. So I just have some thoughts there, you know, dry grass, you have availability to do some grazing, uh, those kinds of things. 
And then we talked about grazing habits. So this is on my place. This is some deer, some old Mexico that I grazed one year for some game. Uh, and on, on this, this was the, a buffalo grass, coastal Bermuda grass pasture until the drought. And uh, now, and then it got to be mostly, mostly KR blue stem, some buffalo grass and some Bermuda grass and some wheat. Uh, but, you know, sort of look at those cattle, how they, so they, they got turned out to this pasture. You see, they're all sort of grazing out together, right? They're all sort of moving out together. There's plenty of grass out there. So watch them. Uh, changes will occur sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, certainly by month. Uh, longer grazing periods. So cattle get up in the morning and they sort of go out and they start eating, they get a drink of water and they start grazing. And then if they get full, they'll go lay down. Well, when do they lay down? Do they lay down at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or two o'clock? Because the longer it takes for them to fill up, that tells you something about what's out there in the pack. And then when do they get up? So if they lay down at 11 o'clock, they then they'll lay down for three or four hours. Okay, they may lay down for three or four hours, they're, they're full. Then I get up about two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon, it gets a little bit cooler and graze some more until it gets dark. Then they'll be looking for some place to sort of lay down for the night. Well, if you got short grazing, they get up at six o'clock, they graze them well afternoon, and then they'll just gonna lay down for a couple hours because they gotta get them to hunger again. And they'll graze in the dark. You know, your cattle ought to be laying down before dusk. You ought to have cattle sort of settling down right around dusk. They ought to all be pretty much quick grazing. And that's sort of an idea. Now, if you went out there after the 10 o'clock news, you're going to see some up because some cattle will get up in the middle around 10 o'clock or so and go out there and graze a little bit. They won't graze long, a couple hours. So think about that, okay? Weather conditions. So there's some Brahmin heifers that were on my place years ago about 2004. The winter of 2004, we had 12 inches of snow Christmas day, Christmas Eve night. And this was sort of the start of it, okay? This was some sleep <coughs> that we had Christmas Eve, 2003, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Temperature was right at 34 degrees and that was a sleep coming in out of the north. Uh, and what are the weather conditions like? Hot, dry summer, that's what we're expecting. What's gonna happen in terms of grass quality? Uh, what about fall? What about winter? If it gets cold, even in the valley, when it gets cold for those one or two days that it really gets cold, uh, it, it, we can increase energy requirements, okay? And particularly if they're wet and cold. Now, these cattle were not wet, okay, because it was just sleep and it wasn't wet sleep. But nonetheless, you can tell by looking at them that, that they were cold. So fecal pads. So Fecal pad, fecal pad work was actually done by a, a former range specialist and colleague of mine, Dr. Wayne Henselka. It was done back about 1985, 86, uh, right before I got here, although I did get the help on doing some of that. Uh, Wayne was working with a range scientist by the name of Jerry Stooth and a range specialist that some of y'all will recognize, Dr. Robert Lyons. Dr. Lyons is the associate department head for range science extension and also the extension range specialist in, uh, in Uvalde. He's gonna retire by the way, this year. Uh, he did this work as part of his PhD dissertation. And what they did is they said, okay, whatever an animal eats, uh, there has to be reflection on what, what passes out in terms of diet quality. And so what they did is they, they watched what animals ate and they had a little esophageal cannula. So whatever they ate passed over into a sack and they analyzed that. And then they allowed those animals to eat some more. And then they, then they, then they, and they analyzed what actually came out in their poop, okay? And uh, what they realized is that the shape of the poop, the shape of the pie, the consistency of the pie was reflection of uh, their diet quality, the, what they were actually able to eat. And so this is an example, and, uh, and, and, and these are all examples of where, of where uh, 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 the top example is the type of quality that the animal was eating. The bottom two basically were just taken in a dry lot. Uh, so, that, so there was actually more to eat there in that second pad uh, than, you, th th than, it, than, than just dirt. Uh, but nonetheless, you can kind of see the differences. So a nice, nice pie shape 
here we start to see some lines start to develop, but still sort of a nice pie shape, okay? And then here we not only see clumping, all right, and serration or divisions in this, so really lots of very coarse material. So very high protein diet, very high digestible energy, a little bit less in terms of protein, not as much digestible energy. And then here is almost very little protein, very little energy diet. And, and this, you see these changes within a few weeks or a few days, actually. So if you took a cow, if you took a set of cows that had cow pies that look like this and turned them, excuse me, and turned them into a new fresh pasture, within a few days, their cow pies would look like this. Or if you took a, cat, a group of cows that, whose cow pies looked like this, but there was still plenty of standing grass, and you supplemented them with protein, you would watch their pies change to this consistency, to this consistency. Because what these cows really lack right here is protein, okay? And uh, so, you know, that's an important to pay attention to looking at cow, get yourself to looking at things like grazing habits and looking at fecal material, okay? And the other thing is body condition. Now we've known about body condition scores for probably 75 years. The main, main work of body condition scores was actually done in dairy cattle, but in South Texas, most of that work was done by the researcher by the name of Jim Wiltbank, Dr. Wiltbank at the Beeville Research Station, uh, Research Center uh, back in the 1960s. And what he realized is he was doing a lot of pregnancy checking work, rectal palpation, and he was looking at how fat these cows were. And he noticed that cows that were in good shape or fat cows were actually bred further along than the cows that were not in as good a shape. And that got him to thinking that maybe fatness has some sort of an effect on the ability of a cow to cycle and get bred. And that's exactly what we found out. Cows that are really thin, you can see all their ribs or most of their ribs, okay, tend to not breed up as well. And if they do breed, they tend to breed a little bit later in the breeding season. They take longer to get bred. And so we talk about body condition score, sort of the optimal is like a body condition score on a scale of one to nine, one being extremely thin, nine being extremely fat. If you could see me, you'd tell me, you'd know I was a 10, all right? But we like to see at least a four in cows and preferably a five or a six in heifers. And so this girt cow that you see right here, okay? She's sort of a five, okay? And so what we look for is we like to look across the top of her back, okay, just like you see right here. You don't see any of the vertebrae showing. Her, her backbone's got some cover on it, all right? We want to look at her, at her hip bone or her hook bone, all right? And we see that it's rounded. It's not angular. We come back here and look at her pin bone or her tail bone, and we see that it's rounded. So she's got fat cover back in here, not much. If she's a body condition score five, she has only about a tenth of an inch of fat on her to make her look like that. And then of course, we wanna look at her ribs. So a cow's got 13 ribs. And so her last rib is about right here. And we can see that all of her ribs covered. So you don't really see all a cow's ribs. Her fifth rib is about right here. Her first four ribs are covered up by her shoulder. And so typically we can see about her fifth to her 13th rib, but all of her ribs are covered up. So this is a five, okay? So let's look at some cows. So these are some cows actually from Hidalgo County back during the drought, back uh, about 1998, I guess. And we were pals palpating some cows for some friends of mine, they're gone now. The, the herd's been dispersed uh, uh, down, at, uh, down, down at White Road, the White Ranch. Uh, and so these were some, some, some of their girts, and, uh, and we took pictures of them. So here's a body, a, to me, this is worse than a body condition score three. I call her the three. She's probably a two. But you can see very easily across the top of her back, you can see, you can see the vertebrae. You can see the spinous processes 
of her vertebrae. And you can see all of her ribs. You can see her shoulder extremely well, you know, and that's not a good thing, okay? These are transverse processes. So if you like T-bones, that's the T-bone of a T-bone steak, okay? And, and she's got nothing left there except bone. There's no fat, there's no muscle, okay? So she's very, very thin. Here's a cow that's about a body condition score four. And you say, well, she, she looks a little bit different. And that's because she's been standing up and I apologize. If we made this picture a lot bigger, okay? You can see that really the only thing that you can see here are these last couple of ribs. And that's sort of the delineation between a body condition score four and a five are those two hind ribs. If you can see those two hind ribs, she's a four. If you don't see those two hind ribs, she's better than that. If you can see more than those two hind ribs, then she's worse than that. And that's what the problem is, okay? And we know that these affect pregnancy rates. Fatness is important for fertility. And then finally, look at physiologic status because, you know, whether or not she's open or bred, she's got a different nutrient requirement than a cow that is in late gestation, a cow that's just getting ready to calve or, or has calved or develop in heifer, okay? So we'll talk about some of these in a second. So I just have some sort of general thoughts there. If you think about uh, supplementation, all right? Uh, cows open mid gestation, you know, typically lots of times for most of us in South Texas, if we've got plenty of grass, not the green stuff you see there in the picture, but just plenty of grass, somewhere about, you know, she needs about four tenths of a pound of crude protein, all right? And that's about two pounds of range cubes or a pound of cottonseed meal, all right? Cows with calves typically need about double that, okay? And so we'll talk about some of those in a second. We need to figure out what it's gonna cost. Now these are old costs, but you just, you need to sort of do the math the same way. What does it cost me for a bale of hay? And am I feeding that hay for protein or energy? All right, and I need to get that hay tested. And so, so Mark, uh, Marcos or Vidal or your county agent can help you get your hay tested. Cost about 10 or 12 bucks to get a protein and an energy analysis, all right? And even if you've already bought the hay and you paid too much for it, if it's crud, at least you know it's crud and you know how to fix it. Okay, get a hay analysis and then decide, okay, what is it that I need to feed and how much is it gonna cost me? Am I feeding it for protein? Am I feeding it for energy? So if just looking at these two charts, you know, if you look at protein and you're feeding good fertilized hay for protein, it costs you about 60 cents a pound. Yeah, it only costs you six cents a pound for the hay, but it costs you 60 cents a pound for the protein. Worse, if you're feeding corn, all right, cost you 80 cents a pound using these prices. But if you're using cottonseed meal, it costs you less than 50 cents a pound for protein. All right, may not be able to feed cottonseed meal or cottonseed cubes, so I'm gonna use range cubes. Well, now I'm up to 66 cents per pound, okay? But if I'm using a block or a tub, and I'm gonna tell you, I use blocks and tubs occasionally because I can't always see my cows. Sometimes I'm, I'm gone for a week or four or five days and when I'm there and they might need protein supplementation, I'm gonna use those products, but I understand what it's gonna cost me. You know, sometimes on these tubs, $700 a ton, and that's probably low today, that's a dollar and 17 cents per pound of protein. That's an expensive proposition to do it long-term. If I'm looking at energy cost, and TDN stands for total digestible nutrients, we use that for energy. So where that comes from is, if I feed a cow 20 pounds of feed supplement, and I measure everything that comes out of her, and only 10 pounds comes out of her, then I assume that whatever it is that I fed her is 50% digestible, because 50% of it disappeared, didn't come out of the cow. And typically we like to see an energy value of around 48 to 50% digestibility. And so if we're looking at this for that, that now we're gonna look at that hay, okay, grass hay, it's about 12 cents per pound of TDN. And that cow's gonna require about 10, 12 pounds of TDN. 
So if she survives and only on hay, okay, if she survives and only on hay, we're going to have to spend a buck to a dollar twenty per head per day for hay. If we look at corn, and corn's a really good source of energy, okay. Corn's about 90% energy. It's about uh, about the same as grain sorghum. Grain sorghum is often a little bit cheaper, and grain sorghum tends to have a little bit higher protein level. So we think about protein level in corn is about eight or nine percent. Grain sorghum can be 10 to 12 percent sometimes. The problem with grain sorghum is we have to process it because it's hard to, to break that to, to break that uh, the, the the kernel. Uh, corn's 14 cents per pound of energy. If we're going to use cottonseed meal, 25 cents per pound of energy. Range cubes, 21, okay? And then blocks and tubs, 44. So there's, there's not any inexpensive products that are out there. But it, we need to know what the costs are in order to use them. So I just have this chart. This is the general nutritional needs. But the reason why I stuck it in is because water is so critical. A cow a cow's going to drink about one gallon of water for every 100 pounds of live weight in a normal day. So that means a 1,200-pound cow needs 12 gallons of water. Now, if it's a hot day or she's lactating, it'll double that. It'll go to two, cow, two gallons of water per 100 pounds. And that's true of calves as well. So we look at energy needs, okay? We, I said, we already said we need to test you know, her intake is around 2%, more or less. And as dry matter as dry matter increases, as it gets to be dry during the summertime, dry matter increases, she can't eat as much. So, and, and this is an example I use sometimes. Think about how much lettuce can you eat, if you want to eat lettuce, versus dry newspaper. Okay, nobody wants to eat a whole bunch of either one. But you can intake, you can eat a lot more lettuce because it's wet, okay? Dry newspaper, it'll take you a while. And that's exactly what happens in terms of intake when dry matter starts to go up like it does during the summertime. Uh, protein needs, so this is some heifers that were on my place a few years ago, some stalker heifers. Um, they're, they're actually eating uh, cottonseed cubes in this particular example. If you feed anything, okay, if you have to feed anything, make sure you feed it in a feeder. Now, these were just some homemade troughs here, okay? So this is some surplus two by eights, and uh, you can see a cinder block down there on the bottom. And, uh, and basically what I had, that was a, that was a two, inch, two foot sheet of, of plywood eight feet long. And uh, they lasted me a couple of years. They didn't last forever, but you know, they, they fit the bill for what I needed because if I'm dumping this product on the ground, I'm going to lose about 10 to 15 percent of it. Cows will defecate on it, they'll step on it, they'll urinate on it. Some just lose it, it's just lost. Get shoved over into a side underneath a piece of brush or prickly pear, and they don't get to it. So if you supplement cattle, anything, put it in a trough. I can guarantee you that you'll save 10 to 15 percent of your bill, of your feed bill by doing that. So protein needs, we talked about protein needs in these heifers, you know, supplemental protein, a little bit of protein will improve digestibility of poor quality forages. So remember we're talking about fecal pads, we talk about that real dry fecal pad. If I put a little, little protein on that fecal pad in that animal, I can change that fecal pad, okay? I can improve it, I can improve digestibility. I don't care what you use. So back to those black heifers that, that particular winter, uh, over here on the right-hand side, that's, that's whole cottonseed that they're getting fed, okay? Whole cottonseed is about 24% protein. It's about eight to 10% fat, so it makes a really good energy source. 1% phosphorus, phosphorus is very critical for reproduction. Uh, and so I would feed them that at the rate of about four pounds a day. Over half of their protein needs were being fed. And of course they had hay out there on this pasture. Over here on the left-hand side, I had some tubs out. So I told you I didn't get out there every day, so I put tubs out. 
Now, when I got home, I put the lid on those tubs, and then we went back to feed. And then down here at the bottom, this is some pictures of some blocks that were made down in Mexico, down there in Muscas. And uh, what it was is they had that they had rendered uh, some tallow, and you can't do that anymore because that's cow parts. But they rendered tallow and uh, mixed a mineral and molasses and grain and made blocks out of five gallon buckets. So it doesn't make any difference what the form of the protein is. The amount that they're that they consume is what's important. So what about energy? So this happens to be over in Webb County and Laredo. You know, you, you go out there and look and look at your pastures and say, what is it that I need today? What will I need three months from now? What will I need six months from now? And make your plans accordingly. Do you may need just need energy? Do you need protein? Or do you need both? So here's an example. This is up near Carn City. I took this picture many, many years ago. And this is a this is a pasture that's a Klein grass field in the dead of winter. So Klein grass is a bunch grass. There is plenty of energy out there. You could strike a match and it would blow, it would burn. But very, very little protein. And so a little bit of protein in this type of situation in the dead of winter, you have plenty of dry grass. This is the kind of product protein will work in this particular this particular situation. Okay, this is the springtime. This is over at my place. Grass is still pretty green, pretty wet. Okay, not a lot of it. So I need energy. But I don't really need corn. Okay, but I need energy. So this is where I used hay. Okay, and so I used some hay. It didn't do a very good job, obviously. But when I feed hay, I typically feed hay in the same place time after time after time, unless it's wet and muddy because I don't want to have a bunch of hay spots scattered all over my pasture okay, that I have to come back and burn later. But cows are going to need about 10 to 12 pounds of energy. This is a good way to supplement energy unless you're going to pin them up somewhere and feed them corn in a trough. What about this? So this is over in Jim Wells County back about 1988. We were burning some pear uh, and uh, you know, th this is a situation that nobody wants to be in. Uh, you need both hay and energy. You're feeding them everything. Uh, during the drought of 2011, 2012, I basically pinned up all my cows in a five acre trap, uh, hauled out about a dozen feed troughs and bales of hay, and I fed my cows for 144 days through the drought. It started raining about 65 or 70 days into that period, and I left them in. It left them in to let the grass continue to grow. Uh, cost me about the two dollars a day. And so basically, what I did is I took all the winter feeding expense I would normally have and put it into saving those cows during the drought. But you have to make those decisions. Okay, all those cows calved in that pen, all those cows rebred in that pen in that in that 145 144 days so you know you have to decide do you want to sell your cattle when you get into this situation but don't feed them out on pasture bring them in and find them so i've got there's a couple of couple of really good charts here i did not develop these dr dennis heard dennis was our uh, extension beef cattle nutritionist uh, when i was hired 35 years ago he retired about uh, 15 years ago and so what he's got up here, this chart, he's got a thousand pound cow. I wish he'd made it for a 1200 pound cow, but he didn't. A late bred cow, so she's sort of in her last part of gestation. And she's got different body condition and different forage quality or hay quality. So here's the body condition scores, a three, a five, a seven. And then it's got different range, pasture or hay quality. So this is high quality. The middle one is middle quality or average quality, and then this is low quality. So right now in the springtime, this is what you'd see. This is about what we'll see in the summertime, and this is sort of what you see after your first frost, if you have a frost, okay? And so then he says, okay, well, how much of different products does this cow need? So if we look across here, you can see that in terms of crude protein, a cow that's really poor condition, okay? will always need more protein. 
she'll always need more protein. And then of course the cow that is in really poor body condition will and, and it will always need more energy. So mega calories is a measure of hay, but of energy, excuse me. It looks it look down here at the very bottom. And what he used is he used cottonseed and corn. Cottonseed meal is a source of energy. Corn is a source, uh, excuse me, cottonseed meal is a source of protein. Corn is a source of energy. And then of course, hay. And you can kind of get an idea of, okay, how much, if I've got cows that are body condition score three, but I've got pretty good pasture, okay, or I've got pretty good hay or pasture, what else do I need? Well, they need about a pound of energy, a pound of corn. If they're in really good body condition, five or six, you don't need anything, okay? And then if you've got sort of average quality as we sort of go into the summertime, if cows are still in pretty good shape, you don't need to feed them anything. But if you've got some thin cows out there, it might behoove you to take those cows, bring them up and feed them separately, about five pounds of grain, five to five and a half pounds of grain. Now, when we feed grain, whether it's corn or milo, you have to feed it in small amounts every day, okay? So you don't have, you, you can feed two, three, four, five pounds a day, but you may need to make sure that it gets to them every day. You can't skip a day and double up. If you do skip a day, start back at what you were feeding. Don't feed them twice as much. Now that's not true of protein. If you're feeding a protein feed, you can double up or triple up and feed every other day or every third day. So let's say, for example, I'm feeding cottonseed cubes. And I'm feeding my cows two pounds of cottonseed cubes every day. And I say, well, I gotta go see Marco tomorrow. All right, and then I gotta go see the Dow two days after that. So what I can do is I can double it up. So I can say every other day, I'm going to feed four pounds of cottonseed cubes. Or every third day, I can feed six pounds. So I can double it up or I can triple it up and not have any impact, negative impact on their digestion, okay, or in the supplementation program. So keep that in mind. So if you've got cows at one end of the county and another end, you don't have to drive both places each day. You can go one place one day and one place the next if you need to. In fact, we've seen that you could actually take a whole week's worth of protein supplement and dump it out at one time, all right, and not have any negative effect. There's still plenty of nitrogen flowing around. But the problem is you always got an old cow or a horned cow or a young heifer and they don't get their share or they get too much. So this is for a thousand pound late bread, and then he's got a separate chart for a thousand pound lactating. And you say, well, I got 1200 pound cows. Just boost all these numbers by 20%. So when you get down, excuse me. So when you get down here to this bottom row, all this right here goes up by 20%. So if she's a lactating cow, she's 1200 pounds, this doesn't, this is now six pounds. We've boosted it up by 20%. We get down here and we say, oh, we have eight pounds. We need to have, you know, actually almost 10 pounds of corn. And this needs to be about one and a quarter pound of, of cottonseed meal. So you kind of see how that works, okay? So what might these cows need, all right? So this is an old picture, some beef masters taking about 1988 outside of Orange Grove, right? You don't see any paint beef masters anymore. But so look at those, those could be your cows you look at there, they got plenty of grass. You got one there that's got, got a calf at side. So this mama right here, she's got a calf at side. That doesn't look like, she doesn't look like she's bred, okay? So these two cows have got different nutrient requirements. This is dry grass. So we know that protein is, could be a problem. We know energy is probably not a problem, but protein could be a problem. We need to go out and look at the fecal material. Look at the fecal pads. We need to look at the body conditions for these cows. Okay, those kinds of things. All right. Marco, I think we'll stop right there for right now.